now we're going to move to, um, again, trying to establish a common conceptualization. You've heard Rafat talk about the what and the how. Everyone is referencing the contextual complexities. And Jim mentioned how important it is to establish a goal for countries of moving towards a theory of change when they're investing in quality interventions. So Pierre is going to help us conceptualize the theoretical underpinnings of the field of quality, as well as talk specifically about what is meant by theories of change. Uh, Pierre is senior vice president at IHI, where he's responsible for large-scale initiatives uh, across the globe. He's also a pediatrician and neonatologist. And he's looking for how to start the slides. <laughs> I'm now randomly clicking buttons. <laughs> Is there some, something I should do? Okay. There you go. Great. Thanks, Sheila. And, and, and uh, thanks very much to the IOM uh, for this really uh, great opportunity. Uh, and I've already uh, learned a, a, a tremendous, tremendous amount uh, from the previous speakers. And I I hope that what I uh, will do in the next 20 minutes is, is just provide a framework for us to have the discussion about these uh, uh, six uh, methods. Uh, the first um, theory we have is that stuff doesn't just happen. Um, and in the words of uh, Paul Batalden, who's one of the uh, uh, co-founders or founders of, of the modern quality movement, as, as was described by Jim, Every system is perfectly designed to achieve the result it gets. So the traffic that, that uh, is trying to get into town uh, in the early morning is, is as a, re a result of a certain pattern, which is specifically as a result of the system uh, that it finds itself in. Um, and those of you who've uh, lived in London know that there was a, 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 a major change that took place about uh, 15 years ago when they introduced the, uh, the central zone uh, where you, uh, you started having to pay a lot of money to, to bring your car inside. And the result that that system produced was that at rush hour, and in fact throughout the day in London, uh, you, can try, you can drive if you're prepared to pay for it uh, throughout the streets. Some would say that that has um, unintended or intended consequences, and that if you know London, you'll find that you can't uh, drive anywhere immediately outside the congestion zone where most of the traffic is now uh, trying to move around. Um, but it is an approach uh, that was taken in London, which is very different to building uh, lots of new um, roads, which brings in lots more cars. So it's just a, an example uh, to say we can really drive um, uh, the performance of a system by rearranging it. And this is the remarkable opportunity that we have, is to focus on systems um, rather than just on inputs, um, because we can do a lot with what we have at, at hand uh, in order to, to get a different result. So what, what is the problem we're trying to solve? So basically, we've got a lot of um, uh, expertise uh, and evidence uh, that uh, gives us data on efficacy, um, which results in guidelines, uh, training modules, and uh, predicted resources that are required uh, to have results. And this is the sort of traditional paradigm uh, that has led to the, the quality movement to try because this particular paradigm on its own clearly cannot give us uh, the result that we need. The problem uh, that we're facing is how can we reliably uh, provide real-life implementation and how can we scale up populations? Those are the, the, the two big challenges, uh, scale up our, our um, uh, implementation to on a large scale. Those are the two areas that we've really struggled with and, and for which we need uh, better approaches. And I think that that is what the six um, uh, interventions that are described are, are trying to do. The way in which we are approaching that is that we need adaptive designs that are context sensitive and context will come up again and again as being a driving factor. And secondly, we need designs that can be scaled up uh, with the resources that we have at hand. So we have Two, there, are, there are two dominant forces, and there are many, many great contributions uh, to the field of quality, but I want to just highlight for the sake of simplicity on two. 
The first is uh, what was given to us by Deming, and the second I will be referring to will be uh, from Duran. So the first theory uh, is that we need both uh, the what and the how, and I know I'm, I, I am aware that we've had uh, conversations about the what and the how already today, but in terms of the what, I'm, what I'm referring to here is evidence-based subject matter, the, the, the guidelines, the protocols, the policies, the clinical training uh, that, that tells us what to do. What Deming said is that you need a very different kind of knowledge in order to be able to implement it and to scale it up. And, and these are much softer issues, and, and, and I think part of the difficulty in, in, in trying to get our arms around this is really trying to characterize what it is that Deming was referring to when he said you need to understand the psychology of change. You need to understand motivation and leadership. You need to have a very systems view uh, about everything that it is that you're doing. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation already about data. Uh, data is absolutely uh, crucial, and, and to Jim's point, I think it's the Achilles heel of the whole quality movement. Without data, we, we cannot do our work. And then we need context-sensitive learning in order to be able to move us forward. And I, and I would ask you, when we're thinking about the different methodologies that are being evaluated, to think uh, about these um, aspects, about how well they do these, uh, uh, in order to get their result. So um, Deming would say that unless you find a way of bringing these two uh, uh, tracks of knowledge uh, seamlessly together, that we're not going to get improvement. So the second um, uh, theory uh, that we um, uh, refer to is, is from Duran, which is the, 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 the trilogy. And I think there is a lot that we can learn from this particular formulation of quality that will help us guide us through the, the challenge that we face uh, in, in evaluating these methodologies. And Duran said, you really need all three. You need to think uh, in terms of quality planning, which starts with a systems view. Um, we need uh, some way of, of uh, controlling um, or regulating uh, quality, which is quality control. And we need some way of pushing the system uh, to a better state uh, uh, of performance, uh, which is quality improvement. And, and he described them as quite uh, separate. Uh, but uh, all being required uh, to get the result. And I think that what you'll see is that these me methodologies that we're evaluating contribute to uh, all three, um, uh, but, some, but we could see them as being more heavily tilted uh, one way or another. And just understanding where they fit in the system, I think, will be very helpful if we're going to uh, strive uh, to reach a, an integrated uh, solution. So in, in Deming's original uh, thinking, which obviously was not applied uh, to health care, uh, he said, if you're going to sit down and plan, plan right off uh, with a, a systems view. Uh, and when you get going, uh, you set your uh, quality limits. You, you say that a system has to work within certain specifications, and this is the, the basis of, of the standards approach and, and the accreditation approach is that we say these are the standards. These are the limits within which we will tolerate uh, performance in our system. And we will keep an eye on it. We will, we will check uh, those parts of the system that fall outside the bounds of what we say is acceptable performance. And we will implement certain strategies uh, to bring them back uh, within control. But what Duran said is that if you really want to shift performance to a whole new level of performance, you need a different approach, which is much more focused uh, and, and uh, is much more um, uh, uh, agile and adapt, uh, adept at, at making rapid changes uh, in response uh, to, to the problem uh, that you're trying to solve. But then you probably need uh, to inter reintroduce uh, your quality control uh, system once you've reached that new level of performance and, again, keep a very close eye on it and make sure that you have a way of, of managing that and all the time, you're learning from what you've done, and you're feeding that back into your quality planning system so that as you move forward, and we'll talk about scale-up in a moment, but you're taking those lessons and that you're incorporating them into better design that can move faster uh, uh, to implement what you want throughout your system. So if we look at it in, in terms of the health system, in terms of these three categories, quality planning, quality control, and quality improvement, we can start to see where some of the methods that we are going to be talking about uh, uh, fit. So in quality planning, it's more about policy, resources, coordination, accountability, and mandates. 
Uh, for quality control, it's more about standards and guidelines, professional oversight, accreditation, checklists, inspection, and a reward uh, censure type uh, of approach. Uh, and for quality improvement, uh, it's about Deming's uh, four uh, categories of what he called profound knowledge, which is uh, the, the, the uh, aspects of change, motivation, leadership, efficient systems, reflective data, and context-sensitive learning. I think what is going to be a little harder is that the world doesn't fit neatly into these three categories. And, and what we'll see as we go along is that the methods that are under review are borrowing from uh, different sides. But I think it is important to try to understand what those methods are essentially trying to do. The engine for improvement is the model for improvement. And I think that there is a sort of an agreement now across all of the methods that there is, a re there is a really great systematic way that we can approach uh, trying to improve performance, uh, which is the three questions that are asked by the model for improvement, which is what are we trying to accomplish, how will we know that a change is an improvement, and what change can we make that will result in improvement, and holding ourselves to this very systematic way of thinking. And that reflects to very clear aims, uh, which would be both numeric and time-bound um, uh, measures a, a set of, of, of actionable process measures and, and, um, and outcomes, and then changes that we believe that will change the system. So outside that uh, framework, the, the methods start to uh, move, okay? Because e each of the different methods you will see uses this paradigm in slightly different ways, um, both in terms of who's making decisions about aims, measures, and changes, where they are amenable uh, to change, and in particular, the length of the PDSA cycle. So we're going to see differences between very rapid PDSA cycles and a plan, do, study, uh, a action cycle that could take three or six months, um, evaluating what you're going to do, making a plan, going off and doing it, and coming back to evaluate. And they are very fundamentally and philosophically different, but they both have an important uh, role to play. Um, and so here you see both increasingly in quality control methodologies and in quality improvement methodologies, the, the, these two, uh, the, the model for improvement is present. And you can find it. And you can talk about your model in terms of the model for improvement, which has a good and a bad side. It has a good side because there's a sort of a common basic thinking about it. But it's a bad side because there really are significant differences in the way that these um, are, are uh, implemented. And we need to, to understand uh, what those differences are. And this is my only long slide. <laughs> but I think it is quite important because what I've tried to do here is to dil distill out the different um, uh, characteristics of quality control, assurance, and quality improvement. Um, and as we think about the different methodologies, some will fit more or less, and it's not, uh, and some will cross over uh, at, at different points. But I think just understanding whether uh, we're trying to control a, uh, the performance of a system or, or radically improve it, uh, I think is really uh, important to understand. So the performance goal for quality assurance is performing to standards across multiple parts of the system, and typically a, a standards-based uh, system will deal with a lot more than a, than, a, than a quality improvement, which is very much more focused uh, on, on one part of the system. Measurement, um, uh, periodic inspection, so uh, before, after uh, changes uh, versus continuous tracking uh, in quality improvement uh, using run charts, uh, for instance. The data systems are typically external uh, for quality assurance. We're coming in and we're watching. We're going to see what you're doing. Um, uh, whereas uh, quality improvement typically works off registers, tally sheets, things that are happening uh, right at the front line. The changes are standards driven uh, for quality assurance, and they are normative. We, we, this is what we think should be happening. We want you to work between these two parameters. Um, uh, but they can be linked to front line analysis. In, in uh, quality improvement, they're theory-driven and they're adaptive. It's, we're, there, it's much more of an inquiry mode. How can we really find the, the way to make this uh, work with it at your, at your front line? Um, the motivation, uh, again, is quite different. The motivation uh, for quality assurance often comes from uh, management. It's, it's enforced with compliance. There are incentives uh, uh, to, to appeal to the people at the front line, and they also use competition. 
whereas the QI is much more of a shared governance model using a lot of internal uh, motivation and has an all teach, all learn philosophy. And then finally, the, both are using PDSAs. On the quality assurance side, they're more management driven uh, and they tend to be slower, although as you'll see, they can use rapid cycles as well, whereas for improvement, it's, it's all uh, happening at the front line with uh, management support and the, and the cycles tend to be very rapid. And I have just thrown this in here, and I don't, this is not a, 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 a this is probably the most controversial place because I think the people who, who, who do this work pro may or may not put themselves at different places on the spectrum, but there is a spectrum between quality assurance and quality improvement along which these methods are working. So accreditation is, is, is probably mostly working on the, the control side, although all of these methods will use aspects of, of both improvement and assurance. COPE and, and SBMR, I, I'm sort of putting more towards the middle, although I put them a little bit more on the assurance than on the improvement side. And the collaborative method is, is heavily on the uh, improvement side, although, as you'll see, uh, reaches back into uh, the insurance side. And I think that they all need uh, um, uh, those different parts. In training and supportive supervision I've put in as a sort of a support. It's not, I think it's agnostic as to where, where it's working uh, on this uh, spectrum. I, I just wanted to go in, into what happens on the front line for these two uh, types of approaches. So if we say that the uh, assurance or control uh, is mostly management driven, it comes from the management, they're using standards as its basis. Um, there is an implementation uh, that comes uh, from, from management will often hit a system barrier, uh, and then we'll go through a review process. And this is the slow uh, PDSA cycle. So a plan is made, go off and do it. We're going to come back and see how you're doing. But more recently, has started to use more and more PDSA uh, methodology at the front line to solve local problems where, where defects are being picked up uh, through an inspection process. Intrinsically, QA is different. QI is different because it sends the problem straight to the front line uh, as a filter to try to uh, solve the problem, teaching uh, methodologies for inquiry uh, and, and problem solving right at the front line. A plan is developed, and there is a lot of emphasis on rapid cycle. So a rapid cycle is the inquiry uh, that leads to eventually to implementation with a certain degree of belief, succeeds or fails, and then there's a, a, a feedback loop. Uh, uh, that, that, that goes back both to the provider and to management, uh, and the system starts again. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to give you a, an example of how this kind of works in reality. So in, in sub-Saharan Africa, 4 million uh, uh, neonates dying uh, every year, or, or throughout the world, 4 million uh, neonates dying every year, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa, and a third of the neonates are dying from prematurity, and here you see a grandmother with her newborn 30-weeker uh, infant receiving kangaroo care, which is a, an adaptation uh, of, of care for very small babies. The problem, what, one of the methods for, for saving very premature babies is to give the mother a course of uh, dexamethasone uh, as the mother goes into labor, and that matures up the lung and improves survival. And we were involved in an in a, in a, um, uh, implementation a project with a local partner in Malawi to try to get uh, to, to, to understand how hospitals could, could uh, implement this change. And this gets to uh, the theory of change. So the theory of change for this particular process uses quality improvement um, uh, thinking, which is the, the, the drivers that you see at the bottom, motivation for change, data systems, and, and a learning system, but has to reach back into uh, the input side or the, the, the assurance side, which is making sure that the drugs are there uh, and making sure that the health workers have uh, skills. So it's not a, a pure methodology that can possibly be used in this kind of situation. You're going to need uh, aspects of both. Uh, in this particular hospital, uh, you can see there's a baseline period from November through des uh, December. These are weekly measurements, uh, which is the percentage of women who are actually getting the corticosteroid when they go into labor. You can see the intervention starts, a big enthusiasm, everyone's using it, it drops back off when no one's looking, and then a system uh, of, of improvement kicks in, and very rapidly you can get improvement to very high levels of, of um, uh, reliability. And then uh, something happens, it turns out that the leader left, 
At point number two, things start to shake around a little bit, uh, but much better than, than, than originally. But you can see this is a typical kind of improvement uh, uh, process. So here we have a baseline period, which is the status quo. We have a quality improvement intervention, and then a zone of control, a new zone of control that is implemented where you keep a close eye on what's going on. And you can see this is not a single uh, application of a single method. There is a, a, a flexible application of a number of different methods that are required. The circle shows things going out of control. Somebody should be paying attention. This ship is sinking. Uh, we need to, to step in and do something. And here is, I, I want to make two uh, last comments. One is about sustainability, and, 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 and the final one is about scalability. So here we have uh, two other hospitals. So this test was done in three hospitals. It was a test of scale-up. Could we find three representative hospitals that looked like the rest of Malawi ahead of a national scale-up? And so these were two government hospitals. Point number one is where the intervention has started. And you can see both in terms of mothers identified and the drug actually given, fantastic result. OK, huge improvement in performance very rapidly after initiation of a quality improvement initiative in both hospitals. Point number two, the, the country ran out of corticosteroids. So uh, it just shows again that we're not working in a vacuum. Okay? The, the country ran out of corticosteroids, and it took nine months to get uh, corticosteroids back into the country, into the public system. Um, if you look at the, the even in the best performing hospital, so this is the hospital that, that actually, uh, because it was a private uh, hospital, actually had access to supplies of the drug. And so that wasn't the rate limiting factor. Here's the inspiring leader uh, who started the whole uh, process off and assembled a team within weeks, got a system from zero to 100% using classic uh, QI methodologies. Here's the new leader who took over. Things wobbled a bit, but she did a, a nice job of maintaining the, um, the process. So that's February 2014. This is June 2014. I visited this uh, 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 hospital in December of last year, and this is what I found. So I found that the hand-drawn line chart had fallen down within the cabinet and, and was obviously not being used. Now, there are a number of factors, and I'm not going to go into what they were, but they were a combination of the fact that the government had changed its mind for good reasons not to pursue the corticosteroid uh, program. Um, but this was actually uh, not just women getting corticosteroids. This is women being assessed for gestational age, a very important step, which is Im important not just for this drug, but just to say that if you don't have a, a supportive system that is, that is uh, led by management, uh, uh, that is part of the government system, you can have a fantastic result for three weeks. But if the supplies run out or if it's not part of a, of, of a greater program, it will uh, not uh, survive. My last point is around scale-up. I think that this uh, Duran thinking can actually be applied uh, uh, to scale-up as well, because I think that a ho the whole sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and whole countries are going through a kind of a quality journey that may uh, be phased. So there may be a, a quality control starting point then, uh, that, that, that gets basic supplies, equipment, uh, performance uh, levels into place on which you can then uh, do some rapid improvement, and then following which you need a rigorous um, uh, quality control system uh, to, to, uh, to sustain it. And, and we've been looking a lot at individual uh, uh, hospitals, the example I gave you. But this thinking, I think, needs to be applied countrywide. And, um, and I do believe that if you think in scale up in terms of, of a, phases, a phased approach, getting set up, understanding the status quo, building uh, scalable models through innovation, uh, understanding the context uh, of scale-up and then going to full scale, it may be that we need to think about these different elements uh, contributing to, to, to different. So I just want to end with the three questions. Are some methods intrinsically more suitable for different aspects or phases of implementation? Should we ensure that large system improvement includes all the elements of the Duran trilogy when we're designing them? And how do we ensure that our improvements uh, efforts are sustained into the future? Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre, for giving us a broad overview and way to think of this going forward. We have time for just a couple questions. Yes, 
If you could just stand up and say your name, please. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Jim Ricca from the Control Child Survival Program. I'm uh, interested in your thoughts on the following. Um, in developed world contexts, we can assume fairly high capacity um, and therefore magic bullet solutions sometimes uh, can uh, be more likely to work, although of course context matters, et cetera. We have to be thinking about system, but that becomes more important in low capacity environments, whereas you pointed out, um, a fantastic intervention can be derailed by something out of its control. Uh, I think um, I've seen things on either side, uh, things that are very simple kinds of interventions that ignore the rest of the context and hope that it works. But of course, there, and then there are also larger health system interventions that don't even try to get involved in the specific context. Is there some middle ground that you see that you can take account of some of the context, work on some pieces of uh, the weak system, but without getting involved in the ra the entire system, which probably is not working particularly uh, optimally in a, a lot of the places that w that are in the middle middle and low income countries. Yeah, I think the the further out you get into specific hospitals and and where the problems are very uh, site specific, I think that you can work in that microsystem and you can try to influence the performance of that microsystem. I I thought the question that you were heading to was, uh, is it justifiable to use a magic bullet um, approach in a, in, in, in a country like Malawi? And, and I, I'm, I think the answer is probably no, um, uh, that we should be using integrated uh, packages of, of care and not, and not single interventions. Um, you know, but we have to collaborate with the global movement, uh, which was saying, use, the magic, use this magic bullet. And that, so there's a lot of pressure to do that particular uh, test. Um, but I think that, uh, and this goes back to our thinking really about uh, research as well. Um, I do think that we have to work in close uh, collaboration with ministries, uh, with districts for naturally organizing units like, uh, like districts and sub-districts when we're organizing both our implementation and our research. And I think it affects the unit size of what we take on. Um, uh, in, in, and, and, and very much uh, has to take uh, account of what else, the context in, in that country, the supply chain, uh, all the other factors uh, that, that will influence. One more quick question. Hadar. Um, thank you, Pierre, and thank you for the, uh, the illustrative example that you provided from Malawi. That's very helpful to have a specific story. I'm, I'm conscious not only in your talk, but also in some of the earlier talks in the day, there's been a discussion about heterogeneity and context sensitivity. It's come up repeatedly already as a theme, I think, of the day. Um, and if we think about uh, adaptation as being a necessary element and bringing things from a quality control, quality improvement, quality planning into the design of a improvement intervention, and if it is as specific and locally adaptive as we're describing it, mm. does that threaten, since part of what we're doing is trying to understand the evidence base, does in fact that degree of heterogeneity actually threaten the potential external validity or the generalizability of research studies that might be done to try to assess this? The paucity of evidence that we have to consider here today uh, might suggest something along those lines, but I'm curious about your view. I think the generalizability is mostly around uh, the, the approach rather than the detailed content. Um, but having said that, and I, I would go back to something that Jim had said in terms of generalizability, I think that there is generalizability of implementation approaches within a country. And I think uh, what, what we uh, are trying to do uh, with these tests of scale up is, is try to explore the different kinds of environments that you may encounter as you're scaling up. Because in order to be able to move fast, we don't have the luxury of being able to do lots of in-depth innovation everywhere in the country and lots of rapid cycle uh, testing. There has to be some adaptation. But we, ha in order to be able to move really fast, and this is maybe my personal belief, you do have to reach a point of standardization where you can really start to move with tremendous local knowledge, which is very context-tested, uh, 
um, uh, that that looks different from an innovation collaborative at the at the earlier side. So I, I think there's there is more generalizability I think than maybe we we are saying here. Um, but num the number one uh, uh, task for for us here I think is is to design a research that tests the generalizability of the method uh, and its applicability uh, worldwide.